Yes, I wanted to start uh, by um, essentially introducing myself and also the uh, people that actually did this work. Uh, I'm, like Brian said, uh, Professor Lilo Pozzo. I uh, work in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Washington. And I've been a long time uh, user of both neutrons and X-rays uh, for the characterization of all kinds of colloidal systems uh, and polymeric systems. And uh, today I'm gonna present to you some of our latest work uh, in the characterization of uh, transport processes that occur in emulsion systems. And I wanna make sure that I acknowledge uh, that this is the work of a, a brilliant uh, graduate student that recently graduated, so he's now Dr. Uh, Yiting Li. And uh, if you want more information about this work, uh, it can be found in this particular uh, publication that came out uh, late last year. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that all of the experiments that I'm going to show you today were performed at the NIST Center for Neutron uh, Research, which uh, uh, in particular with instruments that have been sponsored by the National Science Foundation here at the, um, in the United States uh, and with their Center for High Resolution Neutron Scattering. So uh, first, before I go any deeper, I wanted to uh, uh, motivate the, uh, the reason why we were interested in, in studying transport processes in emulsion systems in the first place. Um, so you can imagine emulsions, uh, which are liquids that are dispersed in other liquids, uh, are uh, uh, found in all kinds of areas of technology. Uh, some of the ones that we are interested from a technological standpoint are things like uh, controlled drug delivery, where you might want to target a particular uh, medicine uh, that might be toxic uh, to a particular tissue. Um, and uh, frequently these medicines might be uh, very hydrophobic. Uh, so you cannot deliver them as single molecules in water. You have to dissolve them into a carrier and, and emulsions are frequently used as uh, this type of carriers. So if you're gonna use this as a mechanism of doing drugs, then you should also be interested in how uh, do these uh, uh, systems uh, deliver their payload and how do these molecules uh, come out of these individual droplets. There are also um, uh, large commercial uh, processes uh, that are used uh, for emulsions where, uh, for example, things like latex paints are produced by uh, emulsion polymerization processes where uh, the latex itself starts as a droplet of monomer uh, that eventually gets polymerized and makes a stable dispersion. Uh, these processes also involve the transport uh, into and out of emulsion systems as they exchange uh, initiated chains and an initiator uh, to effectively drive the polymerization. And in an area that is actually particularly interesting to me, uh, in the food industry, there's all kinds of emulsion systems also. Uh, mayonnaise is one example, but there's many others, uh, uh, things like cream and milk products too. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, delivering flavors or, or introducing flavors or colorants uh, or even fragrances into some of these systems, uh, then you also need to understand how these molecules come in and out of these emulsion systems. So uh, effectively, hopefully that I, I motivate why it's important to understand uh, what controls transport in these complex, uh, complex systems. So let's uh, consider what are all the possible enumerations of different transport mechanisms that we could imagine could come out of different uh, emulsion systems. So you can imagine that um, in one case, uh, let me see if I can use my pointer here. Uh, in one case, uh, a, a, a molecule of oil uh, could come out of one droplet diffused through the continuous phase. And if this is a, an oil and water emulsion, this would be water, and then eventually enter a different droplet. And in this way, they can exchange material with each other. Um, and a different process uh, is uh, very similar, but instead of uh, the oil molecule dissolving into water, uh, in this case, maybe uh, micelle, which is a surfactant uh, uh, aggregate, uh, could actually be the transport vehicle. Uh, they are known to dissolve oils and perhaps they are the ones that actually deliver them from one oil droplet to a different oil droplet. Um, if the emulsion is not very stable, you can imagine that uh, two of these droplets could actually come together and they will form a larger droplet. Uh, this is known as coalescence. 
And if this happens uh, 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 fairly regularly and it doesn't stop, uh, you can imagine that the droplets will get bigger and bigger and eventually the emulsion will phase separate. And so this is a, a mechanism of mixing and transport, but it's also a mechanism of instability where the droplets are actually eventually phase separate and, and form an unstable uh, uh, emulsion phase. So the last mechanism uh, maybe is, is a little bit less obvious, but uh, you could imagine that uh, two of these droplets could also come together. Uh, but instead of coalescing to make a larger droplet, uh, maybe this is just a transient process. They collide, uh, but then they also separate and they stay as individual droplets. And during the time that they actually were together, they could perhaps exchange uh, some of the oil uh, between the different droplets, and this could be a different mechanism for transport. So where does scattering actually come into play here? Uh, well, my talk today is actually going to be about neutron scattering, which is a, uh, a very uh, uh, close uh, sibling of X-ray scattering, which you've heard in the last uh, two lectures. Uh, so I'm going to talk particularly about neutron scattering, and I'm going to talk about small angle neutron scattering. So we talk about this as SANS in, in terms of the letters that make up uh, the word small angle neutron scattering. So in a typical experiment, um, you would have your sample, and then uh, you need to make a collimated uh, beam of uh, neutrons that you're going to impinge onto this sample. Uh, so there's a very complex uh, collimation system. And um, uh, X-ray scattering instruments are fairly long, like they might be five meters long. Um, a neutron scattering instrument, a small angle neutron scattering instrument, is, is even larger than that. So the instruments that we typically use might be 30 meters long in, in total. And this is because we need to actually have very long distances in order to collimate the neutron beam uh, sufficiently to, uh, to actually measure the scattered neutron with uh, good precision. So we have an incident uh, beam of neutrons and uh, they will interact with the sample and they will get scattered and that will change the direction of propagation. And in small angle neutron scattering, we assume that the uh, sample and the neutron beam don't exchange energy in any significant way. Uh, so we're going to essentially talk about this uh, or assume that this is an elastic interaction. Uh, there's no net energy exchange. So what we're going to collect is an intensity uh, that is going to be a function of uh, this uh, wave vector Q that can be related to the scattering angle. And by analyzing this intensity, we can learn about the structure of the materials. Uh, so in the case of emulsions, this is somewhat trivial because these are spheres, uh, but uh, we can learn about the size of the spheres or, or uh, even the size distribution of the spheres. Now, why do we uh, want to use neutrons in, uh, in this particular case instead of X-rays? Um, well, the reason is because neutrons have a very unique uh, dependence in terms of scattering power. So if we look at the uh, cross-section, the scattering cross-section of X-rays and compare that to neutrons, uh, for uh, these uh, atoms, uh, you can look at this uh, schematic um, and uh, you'll see that for X-rays, the scattering uh, cross-section increases uh, with the number of electrons that are actually present in each particular atom. Uh, with neutrons, that interaction is a little bit more complex because it's a nuclear interaction. The neutron is actually interacting with the nucleus of the atoms. So uh, for isotopes, uh, uh, and in the case of this particular work, we're going to be very interested in uh, the isotopes of hydrogen and deuterium, which are uh, chemically very, very similar, almost identical, uh, but their neutron scattering cross-section is actually very different. So what that means is that the scattering length density, or, or you can think of this as a contrast, uh, for uh, two molecules, uh, that are effectively identical, but just have different isotopic compositions. So for example, hexadecane versus uh, deuterated hexadecane, the scattering intensity or the, the scattering power, the scattering length density uh, is actually very different from each other. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of this uh, particular premise uh, to look at how this contrast term changes as we uh, essentially uh, have these emulsion systems exchange uh, the uh, molecules between them. So we're going to assume in this particular case that the structure of these emulsion systems is going to be fairly insensitive or not changing uh, much with time, and that we're primarily going to be sensitive to the scattering uh, changes in the scattering length density or this contrast term. Uh, 
So we're not the ones to, the first ones to actually do this. This is still a fairly recent uh, way of using neutron scattering, but uh, many people have done this in the past. Uh, in particular, this is a very powerful uh, type of measuring uh, transport in, in colloidal systems uh, when you're looking at things that are uh, thermodynamically stable. So uh, one great example of this is the work of uh, Tim Lodge um, in uh, Minnesota. And you can, uh, what they've done here is they've actually generated micelles uh, that are prepared out of polymers. And they prepare two kinds of micelles uh, of identical polymers, except that the isotopic composition or the level of deuterium to hydrogen in the two populations was different. So by tracking the intensity as a function of time, uh, they could actually measure the transport of a single polymer chain as it leaves one of these micelles, uh, goes through the uh, solution, and then inserts itself into a different micelle. And they can track these molecular systems as a function of time. Uh, for emulsion systems, this has also been tried in the past uh, by uh, Professor Caban in, in France. And uh, what they did is uh, uh, very similar to what I'm going to show you today. Uh, they prepared uh, samples of emulsions uh, that were identical, except that one of them was prepared with uh, hydrogenated uh, material and the other one with deuterated material. And they could monitor the uh, exchange of molecules um, uh, as a function of time uh, by looking at the change in contrast, or in this case, the change in intensity. Uh, what was interesting about their work is that uh, they could actually measure significant uh, decreases in the intensity as they exchange material uh, without uh, any uh, uh, significant change in the size of these emulsion systems. Uh, so they, they would eventually uh, coalesce and have different um, instabilities, but this would actually happen at a longer time, uh, way before, uh, way after the uh, exchange had actually occurred. So um, preparing this experiment is a little bit tricky, and it does require quite a bit of um, uh, lab work and careful lab work. Uh, so I'll tell you this up front. Uh, but in principle, it's actually a very simple experiment. It's just that a lot of pipetting, a lot of careful pipetting has to take place. So what the experiment actually consists of is that we are going to have two identical emulsion systems, and you want to prepare them in, in, in as identical uh, way as possible. So you want to be very careful, make sure that their size distribution is about the same. Uh, and the difference between these emulsions is that one of them is going to be enriched in the deuterated material, and the other one is going to be enriched in the hydrogenated material. Uh, but because isotopes behave chemically uh, identically, we can actually treat these two uh, in terms of colloidal systems as also being identical. And then the other thing is the solvent that we use, in this case is water, but we're also going to use a mixture of heavy water and regular water, uh, hydrogenated water, such that if these two systems uh, fully exchange their oil, uh, the scattering will be as close to zero as possible. So what will happen here is that if we, at time zero, mix these two populations together, um, uh, at time zero, uh, the scattering should be identical to the scattering of the, either of the two populations. And this is because the contrast in the solvent uh, is designed to be identical or right at the middle between the two different uh, populations. And you can do an experiment uh, by scattering of the individual uh, emulsion systems and, and, and make sure that this is a good check, uh, that they, in fact, actually scatter identically to each other. So then if you mix them at time zero and nothing happens, let's say there's no exchange in oil, uh, then you would expect nothing to happen. And your intensity, uh, which is here shown in, in uh, essentially the y-axis of this plot as a function of the wave vector, should be identical and it shouldn't change with time. But if there is exchange of oil between these emulsion systems, then you should see a change, a net change in the intensity. And usually, this should be a decrease in the intensity uh, that you can then monitor as a function of time. And in this way, extract information about the kinetics of how these molecules uh, come into and leave uh, emulsion droplets. So uh, we've done a lot of these experiments. Um, and, um, and I'm going to show you some, a lot of plots that look like this one here. Uh, so this is now uh, experimental data, and you can see uh, what happens uh, as you essentially monitor an emulsion system uh, that has no surfactant. So this is a very unstable emulsion. Um, you can see that there is a decrease in the intensity, but this decrease is actually very, very slow. It takes 
uh, 370 minutes and, and you, uh, you decrease a little bit the intensity, but not by very much. So what happens uh, if we then uh, intentionally mix these uh, same uh, droplets by uh, actually applying ultrasound, which is the mechanism we use to make the emulsions? Uh, in this case, we're actually forcing the droplets to collide with each other and to mix intentionally with very large forces. So when this happens, uh, we recover a uh, almost zero scattering intensity. It's a flat line because there is an incoherent scattering background in, in neutron scattering that, uh, that is, is going to be always there. So, uh, so we know that these uh, droplets could have exchanged oil, but they didn't, or they didn't in any appreciable amount of time. And the reason this happens is because hexadecan is fairly insoluble in water. So uh, there is a, a very, very slow process uh, for it to actually uh, go from one droplet to the other. So what happens when we add surfactant? Uh, now we are going to stabilize the emulsions uh, and we're going to sonicate them, prepare them in the same way. And this was done with a very standardized procedure. Um, what we see is that uh, the decay now becomes more appreciable. So if we have, a, for example, one millimolar of sodium dodecyl sulfate, which is a standard uh, surfactant uh, that can stabilize emulsion systems, uh, we see that there is a net decrease in the intensity um, that is appreciably faster than when we don't have any surfactant. I will note that this surfactant was not a uh, contrast match. So this was purely hydrogenated surfactant. So you can imagine that this will never fall uh, back down to zero because the surfactant contributes to some of the scattering signal, uh, even after we intentionally mix these, these samples. Uh, if we add more surfactant, uh, we see again a different uh, rate. Now, uh, another thing that is, comes about strategy of how to organize these experiments, um, you'll notice that the times are very long and, uh, and they don't match with each other. And the reason this is is because we actually were doing this experiment with multiple samples in the same rack, and we were essentially measuring them at, at different times after they were initially mixed. Uh, so this becomes difficult to interpret unless we uh, treat the data in a different way and we actually look at it in a different way. And I'm going to show you how to do that uh, in the next few slides. So, uh, but still qualitatively, we know that by adding surfactant, uh, we've somehow uh, increased even just a little bit the exchange rate of uh, oil between these uh, emulsion droplets. And uh, we also know that the, uh, the uh, presence of SDS uh, creates a, uh, an excess scattering intensity even after we intentionally mix these droplets. So uh, what happens if we, instead of changing the surfactant concentration, we, for example, change the temperature? Well, you would imagine that as you increase temperature, uh, that the uh, acceleration of the transport systems uh, would actually happen because uh, molecules become more soluble, uh, their kinetic energy also increases, and this facilitates uh, the movement of uh, dro uh, droplets and also of single molecules uh, across all of the system. And uh, this is exactly what we see. We see that there is an acceleration, uh, at least qualitatively at this point, uh, of the transport as we increase temperature. So increasing temperature increases the oil exchange rate. So now, uh, like I mentioned before, um, this is great, uh, but it's somewhat qualitative at this point, unless we uh, can quantify this uh, by uh, analyzing the data even further. So uh, again, I show you this uh, equation that relates the scattering intensity to the contrast. Uh, term of this particular uh, uh, this particular motion system, and uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to assume that the at least for now, and I'm going to show you later why this assumption is justified. We're going to assume that the rate of coalescence or the instability of these emulsions is fairly slow, so that effectively any change in intensity that we're seeing is primarily due to a change in the contrast term and not to a change in the structure or in the shape of these, uh, of these molecules. So if we assume this, then we can actually uh, use uh, this uh, relaxation function that is defined as the intensity at any given time um, minus the intensity at infinite time. This would be, uh, in our case, the intensity after we intentionally mix the, uh, the samples. That would be the equivalent of waiting infinite time. Um, divided by the intensity at time zero minus the intensity at infinite time. And if you take the square root of this, uh, 
uh, this should be proportional to the, uh, the change in the scattering length density, uh, which is proportional to the exchange rate or the composition change in the samples as a function of time. So um, now I need, I've made an assumption here, right? And I assume that the uh, size change in these emulsion systems was gonna be negligible. Unfortunately, emulsions are not thermodynamically stable. If you have a MISO system, then you can assume they're thermodynamically stable and therefore uh, their size shouldn't change as a function of time. In this case, uh, the emulsions could collide and they could destabilize. So we have to actually prove uh, uh, to reviewers that this uh, was actually a very small change uh, in this particular system uh, during the duration of the experiment. And uh, you can do that by actually fitting your, uh, your scattering intensity of a sample that is pure. So this is just a pure deuterated hexadecane sample. And we can monitor the size change as a function of time. And we see that the, uh, the size change is actually fairly, uh, fairly small uh, with respect to time. So what that allows us to do is then to apply this equation so we can go from a plot of intensity versus a wave vector to now a plot of this uh, relaxation function as a function of time. And this gives us these uh, new plots that we can then interpret uh, by fitting them to some relaxation function. And in our case, uh, we're gonna use a simple exponential function, but we're gonna add uh, a, a constant also uh, that is going to uh, essentially characterize a process that is uh, too slow to actually measure in the time scale of our experiment. So we know that there's an additional process uh, that actually uh, prevents these emulsions to completely exchange all of their oil, and that this is uh, is an unknown process for now. But we know that it is actually too slow to characterize uh, with the time that we had allocated for this experiment. So uh, we have now a lot of data that we've collected in these particular experiments, and I'm not gonna go through all the details, but uh, you can see that we're changing uh, the emulsion uh, uh, surfactant concentration, and we're changing temperature, and we even changed the type of surfactants, and, and you can go into to see those data in, in the original paper. Uh, but you now have all, these, uh, all of these individual uh, uh, systems. Uh, you could fit them to extract information about the size of the emulsions, and we did this also too. Uh, the difficulty here is that in this particular instrument that we're using, um, we weren't qu quite covering enough of a large Q range uh, to get a very, very good uh, estimate of the full size distribution of these droplets. Uh, so we know, uh, we know roughly what their size is and we know that it's not changing very much. Uh, but if you had a larger uh, Q range, then you wouldn't have to assume that the size stays constant. You could actually measure the size and also the change in the uh, contrast uh, together at the same time. So we can transform all of that data now into data that is now uh, in terms of a relaxation function as a function of time. And we can fit this to the exponential functions that I showed you before. Um, and what we can notice already is that when there is no surfactant, uh, the relaxation is always uh, slower as we uh, qualitatively could uh, perceive. Um, when we have surfactant, uh, all of the data seems to collapse into uh, very similar uh, relaxation functions, uh, unless we're at higher concentrations, where uh, higher concentrations and higher surfactant concentrations will give us a little bit faster relaxation. So we can also then now take the decay constant, this k parameter, and look at how it actually changes uh, with the composition of the emulsion systems. And what we see is, again, this uh, decay rate is very slow at, uh, when there's no surfactant, and then stays fairly flat uh, for low temperatures. And uh, it, it, it might increase only appreciably at the highest concentrations of surfactant and at the higher temperatures. So what is interesting about this now is that we can compare also uh, when there are these micelles, right, that could actually transport oil molecules and where there aren't micelles. And what we see is that there isn't any appreciable acceleration in the transport rate uh, when we have or when we don't have these vehicles for transport. So what this implies is that uh, micelles are probably not the dominant uh, mechanism that is uh, actually moving uh, oil from droplet to droplet, at least not in this particular case. And then there's this, uh, this increase that, that remains, uh, at least for the time being, um, um, uh, we have hypotheses for why there's a, a small increase, but, uh, but this requires further proof to, to determine what that is. Um, so again, uh, similar relaxation functions, and we can extract 
information about the kinetics of, uh, of exchange for, for these type of emulsion systems. And you can imagine all kinds of experiments where you change the emulsion uh, concentration, you change the uh, emulsion uh, composition, different oils, and so on. So I'm going to show you a few of those experiments in the next slides. So maybe um, one hypothesis that we had is that uh, micelles might still be uh, wanting or, or could influence uh, transport, but uh, because it is a charged surfactant system, uh, maybe there's electrostatic repulsion between micelles and the droplets, and this prevents them from actually uh, getting close enough to uh, move oil from droplet to droplet. So what if we add salt to screen these interactions? Uh, so we did these experiments, and what we found is that when we added salt, um, even up to 50 millimolar uh, sodium chloride, uh, there wasn't any significant appreciable increase in the transport rate. So, uh, so we don't think that this is the primary uh, uh, reason that micelles are not uh, transporting oil. So um, maybe uh, we can do other control experiments. And, and an interesting one that uh, Yiting came up with was instead of using surfactants, maybe let's stabilize the same droplets, but uh, let's stabilize them with particles. And this is uh, what is known as a Pickering emulsion when you stabilize them with uh, particles. So Pickering emulsions are, are interesting because they don't, there's no surfactant involved. So uh, the micelles are not present and they cannot essentially move oil from one place to the other. Uh, but they're also very, very stable. So we know that coalescence is also very difficult to happen. And uh, so the primary mechanism for Pickering emulsion should be of oil molecules dissolving into the water and moving from droplet to droplet. So when we do this experiment with the same oil that I've shown you all of these uh, previous slides, uh, hexadecane, uh, we see that the decay is extremely slow. And this is because it's a fairly long um, alkane. And this is going to be very insoluble in the water phase. Uh, but what happens if we shrink the uh, alkane? We make it a little bit shorter like dodecane or octane, well, the decay then becomes significant. So what we know is that uh, diffusive transport uh, in emulsion systems can, in fact, dominate in certain emulsion systems, but it only does so when there is any appreciable uh, solubility of the oil in the water phase, which is kind of obvious, but we wanted to prove this. And just to further uh, prove this, uh, that uh, how different the decay rates uh, were, uh, we can also do an experiment with uh, surfactant. Uh, and, and in this case, it's not a picking emulsion. It's just a surfactant stabilized emulsion. Uh, but we compare dodecane versus hexadecane. And we see that there's orders of magnitude difference in the decay rate. So it's, it's definitely a lot faster uh, for the shorter alkanes. So this, this can definitely dominate uh, transport. So, um, so what we know uh, so far is that, and I'm going to conclude uh, quickly, uh, is that uh, the micelle systems are not really dominating the transport of oil. And uh, so that we believe that the transport uh, is actually similar to what uh, Professor Caban had actually suggested. And that is that uh, droplets have actually to collide uh, with each other um, and then exchange uh, oil when they're actually close to each other. Uh, so they don't coalesce though, uh, because we don't see any significant size uh, changes as a function of time. Uh, but they actually collide for an appreciable amount of time, and this is enough to actually allow for exchange of, uh, of droplets, uh, of the exchange of oil between droplets. Uh, for the higher concentrations of surfactants, we believe that um, micelles might actually uh, have some um, additional interactions that can actually induce uh, further attraction between droplets, and this is just a hypothesis at this point that remains to be, uh, remains to be proven. So I'm going to conclude here, but I'm, I'm going to show you uh, some additional uh, experiments uh, very quickly that we did uh, in a sister paper that was published in the same journal at the same uh, time. And in this case, what we did is we uh, developed this uh, ultrasound sample environment that allows us to interrogate uh, our emulsion systems as a function of uh, an external, uh, applying an external field. So this is, in this case, ultrasound. Um, and you can read the details about this sample environment in this particular publication. Uh, but what is interesting is that when we do uh, these uh, experiments uh, with ultrasound, so now we're applying ultrasound while the sample is in the beam line, uh, what used to be an exchange rate that would take us uh, long, very, very long times, uh, so in this case, uh, up to a day, 
uh, now could actually exchange the rate uh, in, in a matter of minutes. So by applying ultrasound, we uh, grossly accelerate this because we're now pushing droplets uh, to coalesce and to exchange their oil. So I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to uh, summarize uh, the conclusions. Um, we know that uh, micelles are not the primary mechanism, at least in uh, sodium blood acid sulfate hexa, they can uh, stabilize emulsions. Uh, we do know that uh, soluble, uh, solubilization of oil can actually dominate when the uh, oils are lower in molecular weight, um, and that this can actually be the dominant uh, mechanism for, for uh, shorter uh, oil molecules. Uh, but for insoluble oils like hexadecane, the primary mechanism is through direct collisions of oil droplets uh, that they exchange uh, 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 oil uh, as a function of time. So with that, I'm, I'm going to conclude and answer uh, questions. I want to acknowledge my group, uh, the uh, essentially beam time from the uh, NIST Center for Neutron Research and the funding agencies in this particular case was by the uh, Petroleum Research Foundation. So thank you very much.